Thanks for joining this session. My name is Mike Santonis. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at CrowdStrike and I'm really pleased to be able to share this presentation with you all today. I was hoping to obviously be at an event in person together, uh, but obviously with everything going on around the world right now, uh, we're going to be using this online format and you get to see a staged corporate picture of me instead. Uh, a little bit about my background there. But more specifically, let me touch on uh, the topic uh, and the content for the event. Uh, we've just finished some threat research, so I really want to leverage some of that uh, in the presentation today. Uh, the theme of the presentation is ransomware innovation. It's not only for the adversary. The idea here is that adversaries continue to innovate and you need to be innovating so you always stay protected against the latest attacks and the latest adversaries. So let's get into it and let's have a look at how bad the problem is using some of that threat research that we've just released in the CrowdStrike uh, Overwatch 2020 threat hunting report. Uh, the report is based on threat data from CrowdStrike Falcon Overwatch. It's our managed threat hunting team and it's data that we released in September of, uh, of this year from September 15th, so very, very current. A couple of notable uh, report findings that I wanna to touch on. The first one being um, hands-on keyboard intrusion activity. Uh, and then looking at, at, at e-crime. Um, we've seen an absolute explosion in hands-on keyboard uh, intrusions in the first half of 2020. It's already surpassed all of 2019. Uh, the amount of attempted breaches that we investigated and, and stopped uh, in 2019 was about 35,000. In the first six months of this year, we're over 41,000. So it's gonna be a big year for us from that perspective. Uh, a lot of this is based on uh, the continued accelera acceleration in e-crime activity, but it also has been uh, impacted uh, by the effects of the pandemic. Um, it's presented uh, an expanded attack surface as people start to work from anywhere. And we're also seeing uh, opportunities created for, for adversaries to exploit public fear through COVID-19 lures, as an example. And then when you couple that with uh, the e-crime activity that we see, which is increasing in volume and reach, uh, in the last couple of years, we've seen e-crime activity outpace state-sponsored activity. Uh, not because um, state-based actors are declining uh, or slowing down their operations, it's simply because of the fact that we do see more e-crime actors uh, because there's so much money being made and to be made. Uh, so it's, uh, it's certainly, going to be a pretty big year uh, from, from uh, a cybercrime perspective. It's uh, 2020, the year that keeps on uh, giving. And obviously, from a cyber perspective, uh, we don't see any slowdown at all. So let's look at the tradecraft and some of the actors involved in, in these styles of attacks. Um, here's a classic example of how e-crime actors work. Uh, this is the traditional approach and the basic model we all know well. Uh, it's where uh, a user gets an email, it's, it's, it comes with a link, um, they click on the link, they download a file um, that contains the ransomware binary, they execute it, it deletes backups, terminates processes, encrypts data, uh, you're held for ransom, we know how that model works. Now, whilst this still happens, um, this is not really the way adversaries work today. It's too easy for them to be uh, caught. I don't want to suggest that it doesn't work. It works and it works well. But if uh, you want to ask for one, two or five million dollars or more, uh, this is probably not the method that is going to be used. It doesn't maximize your opportunity if you want to carry out that style of attack and, and ask for, for big sums of, of money. This is more what we see in 2020. It's basically um, where adversaries have changed their approach to ransomware. They've changed uh, their tradecraft and the way they look to monetize their techniques. Uh, we see ransomware as a service, data extortion, uh, adversaries that are opportunists. Um, and obviously this is a, a growing area as mentioned. I'll kind of summarize in three ways. The first being that the actors are incredibly aggressive, um, even brazen. We see examples where um, hosts with the SMB protocol exposed to the internet um, being targeted by tens of thousands of logon attempts on a day. Um, we see examples where the adversary, when they're on a box, move through their kill chain in a matter of minutes. Um, most of their tool set is off the shelf. Um, the hashes, the file names very rarely change. 
Um, so that sort of approach really indicates that they don't care about being caught. The second point is um, the, the preparatory measures that are taken to ensure success and to maximise impact for um, uh, ransomware. So uh, they seek to destroy security products, to disable and destroy security products. Uh, they look to make sure that, that the data files are right accessible for ransoming. They harvest credentials. They use them to scan the network for accessible file shares that they can also uh, ransom uh, as part of the attack. And finally, their opportunistic targeting of victims, which is indiscriminate. Um, that includes uh, healthcare. Uh, healthcare has come under huge attack this year um, uh, and, and certainly since the start of, of the pandemic. So let me touch on two groups. Uh, the first one that I want to touch on is Twisted Spider. I'll move on to uh, Pinchy Spider next. Uh, Twisted Spider is the group behind the development of Maze Ransomware, which is probably well known uh, to many of you listening in. Um, now, this ransomware uh, was first observed in 2019, but the group really became um, uh, very well known in November 2019 when they really started with their brazen attitude towards their victims and their willingness to speak with security researchers as they began their big game hunting um, tactics. Now, uh, the, the whole concept here, uh, while other actors have threatened to release data uh, in the past if a ransom wasn't paid, um, Twisted Spider really made this act their anthem and they created a dedicated website to leak data if victims were unresponsive to the group or refused to pay the, the ransom. Uh, now, this, uh, this group became really big in, as of February of this year. Um, we saw, for example, the, the ransom amounts uh, upwards of seven, seven and a half million US dollars. And we see that this group, um, you know, Maze could be operated as a ransom as a service, um, but it's also um, more likely that it's being operated by a single group based on their interaction with the media and the leakage of data in a central location. Really well known from a public attack at the start of the year, as mentioned, a California-based uh, security services firm had 700 meg of data stolen and dumped because they refused to meet the ransom uh, demand. So next is Pinchy Spider. Uh, this is the, the group behind the development of the ransomware commonly known as GANCRAB. Um, this was active between January 2018 and uh, the end of May 2019. And this is the actor behind the development and the operation of ransomware named Rebook, which is again another one that I'm sure everybody listening has heard of. Uh, brought into operation in around April of 2019. Uh, analysis by our intelligence team at CrowdStrike identified several overlaps in code between GANCRAB and Rebel. Uh, so uh, the, the link between the two, including the RC4 string decryption, the inf information gathering techniques, command and control techniques, as well as the, the file encryption. Uh, what we saw uh, this year, in June of this year, they began to auction off sensitive data, data stolen from companies that were hit with this malicious software. Uh, and that move really did mask, uh, mark an, es uh, an escalation in tactics um, uh, aimed at coercing victims to pay up and, and publicly shaming those that, that weren't paying up. So it also uh, highlights that we're starting to see um, the, the perpetrators behind ransomware looking for new ways to profit from their crimes uh, as businesses really struggle uh, this year. So. A lot of people talk about using backups, relying on backups to recover and get as, uh, up and running as quickly as possible to not having to pay the ransom. But now organizations are facing, you know, one is the, the encryption event that they need to recover from, but two is the, the data that's been stolen and leaked. Uh, and that's how adversaries are trying to guarantee maximum return from uh, their, their attacks. So here's a classic example uh, of attacks that we deal with daily. Um, this is the way we see most sophisticated uh, attacks take place before the encryption event. Uh, I talked about um, the spray and pray style attack of getting an email, clicking on a link, downloading a file and, and having the encryption kick off. 
But if you want to see how a sophisticated attack works, here's a basic example where we see initial access via brute force, but more commonly through the use of, of purchased uh, credentials. Um, if we see uh, initial access uh, not gained over RDP, uh, we'll see um, someone trying to enable a remote desktop uh, through the use of those stolen creds. Uh, we see examples of defense evasion where the adversary will look to disable security tools, as mentioned earlier. They'll look to change RDP timeout settings. They'll modify uh, the registry to disable uh, UAC, tamper with other uh, security tools that may have been um, deployed in an example that you see there on the, on the screen. Adversaries will use a number of different uh, powerful utilities to do discovery. Examples like PC Hunter, Process Hacker, they'll use them to not only view and terminate processes, but to directly interface with the Windows kernel itself. Um, in many cases, we don't even see them trying to hide these tools to change the name. They run them as is. Uh, as mentioned before, very brazen, they don't care if they get caught. And then they move, they look to move um, uh, laterally once gaining uh, credentials. So everyone's favorite tool, uh, Mimikatz used heavily here, and then um, either using those credentials or through brute forcing, uh, they'll look to start to move laterally across the organization. They'll look to map the local area network. Uh, they'll look to enable or control of systems via RDP. Couple of points that I wanna make here. The next step is typically the encryption process kicking off. But even at, uh, in an example like this, what we will see is uh, something like PowerShell Loader used to run Mimikatz to then run the ransomware binary and to run it reflectively, which means nothing is written to the hard disk, which makes technology like AV pretty um, challenged in being able to do anything to prevent against this style of, of attack. Uh, as mentioned, if I kind of summarize it all, um, we see data being used as a, as a weapon. And this is a concept that's not new. We talked about this in 2016. Back then it was talking about how nation state actors were looking to steal data and use it against organizations. Today we see the same exact tactic, but we see it via e-crime and via dedicated leak sites that the adversaries are setting up. Now, the important thing is to cover how you deal with how uh, you prevent against this style um, of, of attack, how you, how you prepare um, to, to find the attackers, how, how, you, how you prevent the attack, and how you recover as quickly as possible. Uh, obviously, prevention is critically important, but we know signature-based techniques continue to fail against most modern attacks, in particular uh, ransomware. You really need to start to think about leveraging the use of indicators of, of, of attack. Now, what is an IOA? Um, simply put, um, IOAs allow us to identify patterns of behavior that are malicious without relying on signatures or machine learning file analysis. So at CrowdStrike, as an example, we use event stream processing to look at the behavior um, to determine if it's malicious or not. In this example here, we see RDP starting and RDP session has started. Uh, we see credentials being harvested. Uh, preparatory tools that are starting, um, commands used to disable security tools, uh, and other processes being um, disabled before the encryption process kicks off. Uh, some of these tools being used during this particular attack, used by themselves, the legitimate tools, it's okay. But it's the combination of seeing all of them together, the context of all of them running side by side, that should alert you to the fact that the encryption protocol is about to be uh, initiated. Let me show you a more common version that's pretty basic. In this example here, a process executes, it's looking for all the files uh, on the system, uh, it's then deleting backups, ultimately calling the, the encryption routine. Any security professional seeing this would identify this as ransomware, especially, especially if I said uh, process deletes shadow copies, manipulating VSS admin. Um, you could look at these chain of events, build an IOA around this and prevent this attack to stop uh, the process crawling the encryption routine. So this is why indicators of attack are critically important. The next step is to talk about threat hunting for ransomware. Remember, the adversary will always look to prepare the environment for maximum attack. 
like all threat hunting, you need to focus on the right things. So here's a, a couple of examples based on the adversaries that I talked about earlier. Um, this is really a good start for any sophisticated attack uh, beyond uh, just talking about this ransomware example. Looking for brute forcing via RDP and SMB. Uh, SMB. Uh, look for RDP sessions that are running. Look for Team Viewer, for example. Remote desktop that's kicked off. Uh, look for the use of common shared tools. Um, some of these are tools that are used to prepare the environment, particularly in combination with each other. I talked about PC Hunter, Process Hacker, other examples, Power Tool 864, GMA, um, Total Uninstalled Portable, Defender Control as an example. We've got blogs that list all of these tools. Investigate attempts to disable security tools. Always look at that. Um, look for unexpected grandparent processes of discovery um, commands. Look for service manipulations. Look for account creations. Look for privilege escalations. We could go on and on. These are good examples that indicate um, uh, your, your environment may be under attack. Look for ASEPs uh, and, and uh, attackers le leveraging um, ASEP and, and other registry examples. So the final point to make here is you need the right tools to deal with those sorts of adversaries. If you're gonna be hunting for threats, um, you, it requires more than just expert threat hunters. Those hunters need the right tools. They need data, they need a lot of data, they need contextual data, they need threat intelligence. Uh, and all of that together in a way that they can easily access, they know what to hunt, they know what to look for in real time so they can prepare uh, to protect the environment against these styles of, of attackers. So it means real-time visibility. Um, and it means having uh, the advantage of cloud-scale telemetry to get broad and deep visibility delivered in real time. The more data you can get, the better it is. At CrowdStrike, as an example, we leverage a massive amount of data. We look at over 4 trillion telemetry events every week as it happens. The data that you use needs to be enriched. So you need to make sure that your threat um, hunters are using the latest threat intelligence. So they've got access to the latest TTPs that allow them to investigate faster. They know what to look for, they need where to look for it, they need, uh, they need to know uh, on what systems um, these adversaries may be um, looking to uh, attack and looking to hide as an example. So final couple of points to make, a couple of recommendations here. Uh, make sure you have um, EDR technology, endpoint detection and response technology deployed to all systems so there's no blind spots um, on the network. Make sure that you've got access to this telemetry and it's put in the hands of great expert human threat hunters. Um, it's making sure that these groups have the ability to look for stealthy or novel techniques, um, looking for uh, adversaries that are looking to bypass uh, automated monitoring and detection. Um, continuous threat hunting is the best way to detect and prevent sophisticated or persistent attacks. Practice good hygiene. This is really important. Establish control over all software running in your environment. That means eliminating unneeded software. It means patching operating systems, patching all of your applications, keeping them always up to date. Protect your identity. So that means establishing strong password policy, policies. It means multi-factor authentication. It means routinely monitoring authentication logs, looking at account creation uh, and changes in user privilege. And then finally, enlist all your users in the fight. Um, technology is critical, but your users, making sure that they are uh, well-trained uh, they're a huge asset in combating uh, the threat of phishing and related social uh, engineering te uh, techniques and ultimately stopping uh, the breach. So I'm pretty much out of time. Thank you for listening in. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be able to present to you all. I look forward to coming to an event and doing this uh, presentation or another presentation, I should say, uh, in the future in person. I've got my contact details there. Uh, feel free to reach out. Stay safe, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks for your time.